Polish recall campaign called a bunch of reporters out today to tell us they didn't reach their signature goal, but they're going to hold on to those stacks of signatures. How do you convince people to pick you for a job you never really wanted? Kyle sits down with former governor turned presidential candidate turned Senate candidate John Hickenlooper. As tech jobs continue to pour into Colorado, we meet the next generation of women working to break a stigma. And seeing red in Colorado, a store in Estes Park is loving this rivalry weekend in Boulder. Next. We need to start by talking about the weather. This is near Centennial Airport where there was a tornado warning this afternoon. The video is from Debbie Murphy Schillinger. Westbound I-70 is closed at the bottom of Floyd Hill at US 6 because of a mudslide there. There's no estimate when that might right reopen. This video there you're seeing is from Anna Landgren. And there's street flooding too. This is under C-470 there at Acres Green Drive. The video's from Sarah Rohner. Let's get to Danielle Grant. Steve, Mother Nature brought us just a taste of about every weather phenomenon you could think of. Uh, the tornado, the land spout, the dust devil that we saw in the far distance out there in Arapahoe County. Uh, fairly interesting, and of course, the tornado warning that prompted that. Alex Long capturing this amazing shot of that in the distance. Several reports coming into us, mainly the hail, of course, up there toward Floyd Hill, where it was about quarter size, half dollar near Evergreen. We still are watching these thunderstorms crossing the I-25 corridor. The strongest cells now further to off to the east. We're left with a bit of lightning, some heavy rain going just to the east of DIA, a bit more activity going to the south toward Monument Hill, but I think the worst is over. This evening we're watching the storms move out, mostly cloudy skies behind 50s, 60s going in eastern Colorado, 40s and 50s up in the mountains, but storms should be moving out and then by early tomorrow morning we're back with all that sunshine by the afternoon, thunderstorms continue in southern Colorado and then they should move out. Small chance for a few of those turning severe across the northeastern plains and daytime highs tomorrow. Just a bit warmer than today. Back to the mid 80s, 90s across the plains, a little cooler up in the mountains. And then we'll be monitoring the chance for a few isolated storms tomorrow. Widespread Sunday and then hello sunshine and a bit warmer weather, Steve. All right, Danielle, thank you. A developing story tonight. Sources tell Nine Wants to Know Denver Sheriff Patrick Furman is expected to resign in the coming weeks. He started his job as sheriff in 2015. This move comes after several controversies at the jail, including a woman forced to give birth in her jail cell. We'll keep you updated as to when Furman's resignation becomes official. Now, I'm no marketing genius, but when you hold a news conference, I usually expect to hear something successful, you know, like selling your stadium name to a corporation or announcing that you're running for office. But the people who want to recall Jared Polis do it a little differently. Here's politics guy Marshall Zellinger. One minute. It's not often you hold a news conference to announce you did not achieve a goal. The required number to force a Polis recall signature uh, election was just over 631,000. We fell short of that. We were never shown the signatures inside these tubs full of petition packets, but Dismiss Polis tells us they got half of what was needed during the 60 days it had to collect signatures to try to force a recall of Democratic Governor Jared Polis. But these petitions won't be turned in. If they are, the voters who they say signed these cannot sign another recall petition against Polis for the next three and a half years of his term. We will not submit these signatures to the Secretary of State so we can protect the rights of any group in the future to mount any recall effort and you never know where, when there might be one. So what will Dismiss Polis do with the names and addresses collected on petitions they won't turn in? If you didn't do this for data mining, will you be shredding all of the documents behind you? Absolutely not. This, this information belongs to Dismiss Polis and Resist Polis PAC. I haven't even seen it. And no, we wouldn't shred it. And no Democrat and no leftist group would do so either. While Dismiss Polis spokeswoman Karen Cataline told me this wasn't about collecting information, she kind of said it was about collecting information. It's valuable to know who those people are. There's nothing illegal, nor should it be. Everything in politics is identifying your voters. That is not why this campaign was done.
In response, Governor Jared Polis called that a fuss and a sideshow. There are still active recalls against Democratic Senator Pete Lee from Colorado Springs. Those signatures are due Tuesday. A recall effort against Democratic Senator Brittany Pedersen from Lakewood. Those signatures are due in a week and a half. And a recall effort against Democratic Senate President Leroy Garcia from Pueblo. That still has more than a month of signature collection. I wonder if those are also not successful if we'll have news conferences also, Steve. There will be boxes of paper all over town. Marshall Zollinger, thanks. Progressive Democrats in Colorado thought they had a real chance to replace Republican Senator Cory Gardner with one of their own. Then former Governor John Hickenlooper came home from his failed presidential campaign. His entry into the Senate race makes him an overwhelming favorite, even as Democrats nationally and in Colorado moved to Hickenlooper's left. Kyle sat down with him this week. So this week, National Democrats held a, a climate change town hall. If you end up as the nominee, we're going to have a Senate race where we have a Democrat who's been backed by oil and gas versus a Republican who's been backed by oil and gas. <laughs> does, does that put you out of step with where Democrats are these days? Well, A, uh, whatever backing I had from, from oil and gas was always somewhat limited. Let, let me say, say that there was a great deal of, of mistrust uh, on all the way back from when I first got into public life, even when I was still a, a, a mayor. Uh, I would hold what we've done in Colorado in terms of climate change against any other governor or, or even any other mayor when I was mayor of Denver. I mean, we have a very limited window in which we can act. All the more reason to, for Democrats to fight with each other over, you know, how rapidly you're going in this place or rapidly going in that place. You know, I've said for, for 20 years we've got to get to a, a clean energy economy. Uh, and, and I want to get there as quickly as possible. The polling suggests that you are going to steamroll the progressive Democrats who are in this primary. Um, one of your primary opponents, Andrew Romanoff, has been outspoken that the national Democrats, the power players in Washington who have picked you as the guy, anointed you as the guy to win this race, haven't just picked you, but they're telling Democratic strategists that if they work for the other candidates that they're going to get blackballed. Would you here right now tell the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee that that should not be happening and you don't want that in Colorado? Yeah, I don't think that should be happening and I wouldn't want to see that in Colorado. I think that this campaign is going to be decided by the people of Colorado. Kyle's full conversation with former Governor Hickenlooper is on the next YouTube page where you can see discussions with a half dozen of the Democratic primary contenders as well as Kyle's sidewalk exchange with Senator Gardner who has ignored our requests for an interview. Tonight, we are officially adding one more name to that crowded Senate race. Community activist Michelle Ferrigno Warren is scheduled to launch her campaign at 6.30. The Denver Democrat says, she, says her message will be unique Though you have to admit it sounds awfully familiar, her campaign says she will work to eliminate gridlock in Congress that, quote, it's time to rise above the partisan divides. Warren is a former school teacher who moved into nonprofit community development. We've talked about how fast the tech industry is growing in Colorado. It can come with some pretty sizable paychecks, but there's a group largely missing out on those opportunities, women. It made us wonder, what are young girls hearing? Anusha Roy sat down with two nine-year-olds. In between class, Chloe Walsh set aside some time for us. I'm turning 10. She informed us her first double-digit birthday I, I really can't do anything. would not be too exciting. My arm. But it hasn't stopped her from absorbing everything she can about tech. Technology is evolving as we speak. She goes to the STEM lab school in North Glen, where she's already thinking like a businesswoman. You could show the prototype to the to people, like a panel. Of engineers and scientists. Chloe gets a lot of encouragement at home, but knows it's not like that for everyone. People might mistake them as more of the care type, stay at home person, but really girls can do whatever a man can do. She isn't the only one navigating what feels like conflicting messages. Most girls know they can do it, but but other people think they can. These girls have clarity. They can do anything. So do their teachers, who are well aware that messaging is just part of the challenge. There is still a very big gap. Becky Muller with the school is talking about tech jobs. The state says women filled around 23% of all computer jobs in Colorado last year. With the person next to you. When it comes to education, out of the roughly 1,000 computer science graduates in 2017, 
17 percent were women, according to the nonprofit Code.org, and there's a push to get more computer science classes into schools. I really like how math is like a different language. But when you meet these young ladies, I'm going to go to law school. And it is pretty clear that this is a set of numbers that won't stop them. Um, I want to be an artist, a musician, or next. a teacher, an actor, and a I'm a neutral singer, and a dancer, and a gymnast. Got a long list of stuff. Colorado has set aside money to help people learn more about computer science and get into jobs in the field. Lawmakers also approved a policy that allows schools to count computer science toward graduation requirements. CU plays Nebraska tomorrow in Boulder. The big question is whether there will be more Nebraska fans than Buffs supporters. Our Mark Salinger shows us some away fans have already arrived. There's something strange happening in Colorado this week. Oh, big red. Walk past this storefront in Estes Park. Go Big Red! And it's hard not to notice the red. Go Big Red! Or hear the rallying cries. We travel in waves. Most people go by the hundreds. We go by the thousands. They call it a hostile takeover. Appreciate you stopping by. Thank you very much. Go Big Red. And Evan Novotny's shop is at the center of it. It's like Christmas in September. Busiest day of the year. A sea of Huskers fans fills the aisles of Big Red of the Rockies. 2712 out of 100, sir. A store for Nebraska fans in the heart of Buff Country. Who would ever think you could run a shop 36 miles from Boulder? A day before the big game. The red inside the store spills out onto the streets. Just as I drove in, I couldn't believe how many fans I saw. But in a state where wearing red this weekend can split families and start fights. I don't expect a very uh, warm reception for Nebraska fans. The hostile takeover Go Big red. will be settled on the field. Go Big red. For next, I'm Mark Salinger. Uh, that store in Estes Park opened 20 years ago. They say this weekend, not surprisingly, will be their busiest of the year. Colorado's open spaces are getting used and often abused. You can see impacted areas all over this place. Maybe we need to relearn the basics of leave no trace. And what RTD learned this year about driverless vehicles. Next. Apparently, RTD is in no rush to update station signs ahead of the Broncos home opener. Sports Authority Field at Mile High, yeah, that's still the name on the station outside the stadium. If it changes to, if it changes to Empower Field at that station, they will have completely skipped over the Broncos stadium era. Uh, if uh, we're waiting to hear how much uh, it, money it costs of RTD to get the new signs and a new voice recording announcing that new station, for riders. Look into the future. RTD is exploring what is next for the driverless shuttle it tested for months this year. No decisions yet, but it sounds like they learned a lot from that trial run. I got to ride on that shuttle back when they introduced it in January. The so-called Easy Mile AV is an autonomous vehicle. It's 100% electric. It uses a bunch of sensors to navigate and avoid hitting people and things in the road. RTD tested it at its 61st and Pena commuter rail station. People got to ride it for free. RTD learned more about the technology and its reliability. The agency says involving stakeholders from the start and proactive marketing were critical. For now, the shuttle is back with its manufacturer at Easy Mile. Someone decided it would be a good idea to set off a bunch of fireworks at the top of Mount Evans just after midnight on Monday, or Monday morning. So it was illegal, it was dangerous, and certainly not high you Colorado. So we thought maybe it's time for a leave no trace refresher. Most people who go out and climb the 14ers understand that these are really unique places and they, generally speaking, want to leave no trace. Leave no trace. It's a simple concept. Super important that you pack out everything that you pack in. Lloyd Athern has been part of mountain conservation for 20 years. Now he's the director for the Colorado 14ers Initiative. He knows what's up when it comes to taking care of our trails and mountains. You stay to the trail, but you don't pick flowers. Um, those are the basic sorts of leave no trace. Oh, and there's one more. You don't do this. The Forest Service is investigating illegal use of fireworks at the top of Mount Evans. The next day, garbage from the shenanigans was found and will be used as evidence 
to see if they can find who was behind the pyrotechnics. Any trash that was left up there won't decompose. There's just not enough um, uh, activity in the soil to biodegrade any sort of materials. So as the hiking season winds down and we all head out to enjoy the colors, Lloyd Atherin wants to remind everyone. You step on these plants sometimes five to ten times, they can set back the growth significantly or even kill off the, the vegetation. So it's incredibly fragile and people need to treat it with a, a lot of respect when they're up on the 14ers. For next, I'm Tom Cole. Denver has nearly 80 neighborhoods, each with a distinct flavor. I've, I travel all over the United States and all over the world, and I've, I never find uh, tamales as delicious as the ones on Morrison and Sheridan. We'll explore Westwood before a big gathering this weekend. Let's see where leash laws are strictly enforced, or not. And some of our good news, along with yours, next. It is a sign that reaffirms that there is a right place and a wrong place for dogs to roam free. Since dogs can't read, their humans have to, and this dog's human is failing at that. So Steve spotted this at the Frisco Bay Marina at Lake Dillon. An off-leash dog is sniffing around the sign that le reads, Leash Law Strictly Enforced. Apparently it's not as strictly enforced as it says, or this dog's owner got in trouble after this photo was taken. Share the signs that make you smile or laugh. Use the hashtag HeyNext or Next at 9news.com as our email address. Denver's different neighborhoods have a lot of history. Pick one, look it up, and you are likely to learn something new. The Westwood neighborhood is getting ready for one of its biggest celebrations, so we decided let's go learn about Westwood from some of the people who know it best. Westwood is a, a world of its own in many ways. <laughs> Westwood, um, Westwood's where I grew up. I'm a third generation uh, Westwood resident, so I've been here my whole life. Uh, it's just, I, don't know, I love this place. Sounds cool, huh? There's so much diversity in this neighborhood. It's the people that make it unique. It's really close knit. This reminds me of my life, I guess. Yeah, I wouldn't want to raise my kids anywhere else now that we've been here and gotten to know the neighborhood. I travel all over the United States and all over the world, and I never find uh, tamales as delicious as the ones on Morrison and Sheridan. In 57 years I've been here <laughs> and seen the, seen the changes and the, everything around me just going crazy. <laughs> Gentrified? <laughs> <laughs> becoming gentrified. A part of me thinks that you can't stop stuff like that, but I think what we're doing down here is so unique that we have enough influence over here to sort of keep what's here um, the same. My hope for the future for this neighborhood is that people are able to continue to live here, that they can afford to pay their mortgages, their rent. I hope it remains really diverse. I think just going the same direction that we're, that we're going, you know, um, it's been a long trip. Westwood is celebrating its ninth annual Chili Festival tomorrow. It's noon to seven and it is free. Some of your good news and ours is next. Life is good, I can't really complain, but yeah, this week uh, a good thing that happened to us is my, wife, uh, my wife's mother was fearful of a possibility of breast cancer. So she went in, had the test all done and it turns out that it was not. And so she was super excited. That was a big relief. And so they went out to celebrate by eating a steak. But that was a huge, huge good thing. So yeah, super happy. It's Friday. That was Nate Webb sharing his good news. Here's a little bit of ours. Another member of the next team got engaged. Anusha said yes last month during her trip back to her hometown of Seattle. Her man, Mihir Parikh, had both their families surprise her after he popped the question. Even though their families knew each other and they lived about 15 minutes apart in Seattle, Anusha did not meet me here until she moved to Denver. They plan to get married next summer in Colorado. The trick will be scheduling it between all the other weddings that are going on with the next team. Let's review. You've got Marshall and Jana, our digital producer Aaron, and Kevin, one of our other producers here at 9 News, our content producer Austin and Gianna, and then me and Katie. We are Oh. Gotta count me down, man. <laughs>